the Shroud of Turin bears the most intriguing image known. It is indeed one of the world's greatest mysteries. The more amazing evidence is brought to light through solid investigative scientific research related to it, the more, it seems, resistance appears, and the critics claim, the shroud is a forgery. In this video, I will demonstrate how the objections most commonly brought forward do not withstand scrutiny, and the more science is advancing, the more evidence and details are brought to light corroborating its authenticity, and confirming Jesus' historicity and biblical identity, as reported in the Gospels. Professor William Meacham, an archaeologist at the University of Hong Kong who has researched the shroud for over 40 years, describes the shroud as the most intriguing object in the world. He wrote, The Shroud of Turin poses one of the truly abiding mysteries of all archaeological and art historical artifacts. It is the world's most famous textile, and probably also the most intensively studied object in existence. Contrary to those that dispute this fact, this is factually true. Nature magazine stated, the Shroud of Turin is the single, most studied artifact in human history. Joe Marino, world-renowned syndologist, wrote, a medieval artist or artists, would need to be proficient enough in over 100 disciplines and also collectively outweigh the intelligence of the people who performed hundreds and hundreds of tests performed on the Shroud and who are not finding any indications of a forgery. This much is certain. The Shroud of Turin is either the most awesome and instructive relic of Jesus Christ in existence or it is one of the most ingenious, most unbelievably clever products of the human mind and hand on record. It is one or the other. There is no middle ground. Who is right? Many objections have been raised, and dozens of books have been written, disputing the authenticity of the Shroud, attempting to debunk the claim that it is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, and arguing that the cloth is a forgery. So in this video, the most common objections will be presented and examined if these claims withstand scrutiny. In 1988, the shroud was subjected to radiocarbon dating. The conclusion was that it originated in the Middle Ages, between 1260 and 1390 AD. Even Leonardo da Vinci was claimed to have forged the Shroud of Turin. Leonardo da Vinci lived during the Renaissance era, which came several centuries later. The first documented historical reference to the shroud dates back to 1355 when it was displayed in Lirae, France. This timeline does not align with Leonardo da Vinci's lifetime, as he was born in 1452 and died in 1519, which is well after the first known appearance of the shroud. In my view, the single most powerful line of evidence that refutes the carbon C-14 dating from 1988 of the shroud is the facecloth of Christ, the so-called Sidarium of Oviedo. John 20 verses 6-7 says, Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. When Joseph of Arimathea offered his tomb for the burial of Jesus, it was likely a Cochum-style tomb. The main room of the tomb had a bench on its perimeter which was used to prepare the body before placing it in one of the smaller Cochum, niches. In 12 to 18 months, the family would return to the tomb, gather the remains from the niche, and place them in a limestone box called an ossuary. The name sudarium is derived from the Latin word for sweat, sudor. There is a series of amazing coincidences between the two cloths. Both are physically linked. Really fascinating evidence comes to light when this cloth is compared to the Shroud of Turin. There is no doubt that both were in contact with the same individual at one time. The Sidarium of Oviedo is a Christian relic that is believed to be a cloth that was used to cover the head of Jesus Christ after his crucifixion. It is kept in Oviedo, Spain. Here we see the Sidarium during a procession through the streets of Oviedo in 1942. It is a small, rectangular linen cloth, about 34 by 21 inches, 85.5 by 52.6 centimeters, and is therefore much smaller than the Shroud of Turin. The Sidarium's existence is historically confirmed, going back at least to the 6th century, and the radiocarbon testing gave a date, 6 to 700 years earlier than the Shroud of Turin, which brings us much closer to the 1st century. The Sidarium bears numerous bloodstains. Some are post-mortem, and others vital blood. Denominations were given for each bloodstain. Because the cloth was folded, there is a mirror image of the group of central stains, 
formed by post-mortem blood flowing from the nose and mouth after death. The blood stains correspond to a human head. The principal stain was in contact with the face and appears inverted as in a mirror. The principal stain is composed of three groups of superimposed stains. It includes symmetric stains, a butterfly stain, an accordion stain, and a crown of thorn stain. These stains provide valuable clues about possible events during the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. The butterfly stain is a unique pattern resembling the shape of a butterfly, and the accordion stain appears lighter in color, possibly indicating blood degradation over time. The crown of thorn stain resembles the pattern of a crown. If the face of the image on the shroud is placed over the stains on the sedarium, perhaps the most obvious coincidence is the exact fit of the stains with the beard on the face. As the sedarium was used to clean the man's face, it appears that it was simply placed on the face to absorb all the blood, but not used in any kind of wiping movement. Let's try to understand what role exactly the sedarium played during and after the crucifixion. It is assumed that Christ's death happened in 33 AD, Friday the 3rd of April, at 3 p.m. The deceased man had undergone a traumatic punishment and had a crown of pointed objects on the head. He was in a vertical position compatible with the cross. While dead, the head of the corpse was inclined forward, about 70 degrees, and 20 degrees to the right. Allowing access to the nape. A sedarium was required because blood was believed to contain the person's soul and, according to Jewish law, it was necessary to bury it along with the body. It was also forbidden to move a mutilated body without covering it first. Preliminary anointing of the body was carried out for approximately one hour as the body was prepared for transfer to the tomb. This included re-wrapping the sedarium over the head, forcing the arms from the position of crucifixion due to the rigor mortis, anointing the body with aloes and myrrh, and covering the body with a cloth. According to Jewish law, washing the body was prohibited when blood flowed at death. According to the bloodstains on the shroud, it appears that the body was not washed, which is in line with Jewish law. There were several conditions under which a corpse was not to be washed, including if the person was a victim of a violent death and if their blood continued to flow at the time of death. Other conditions included if the deceased received capital punishment for a religious crime, was an outcast from the Jewish community, or was murdered by a non-Jew. Jesus would have fulfilled all of these conditions, but any one of them would have disqualified him from being ritually washed. The reason for not washing a body with blood on it is rooted in Jewish religious beliefs. Blood was considered sacred and contained the essence of life. To wash away the blood would be to wash away the essence of the person. Therefore, if a person had been subjected to any of the aforementioned conditions, their blood was kept on the body, and they were not washed. If not, they would be ritually cleaned and then put in the tomb. The importance of keeping the blood on the deceased is evident in several indications from the shroud. For example, the head was wrapped to contain all the fluids, including the blood. After the corpse was dead for one hour, at about 4 p.m. someone placed the edge of the sedarium along the nape and wrapped a lock of hair with it and he sewed the cloth to the hair to fix the sedarium tightly. It was secured with pins, possibly made from thorns, based on the punctures in the cloth. The pins were conical in shape, similar to a needle. About half of the rest of the cloth was passed around the left ear and in front of the face, covering it and reaching the right cheek. There, the cloth was folded to turn back towards the face providing a second layer in front of the mouth and nose area. In this image, we can see the sequence of how it was folded. It was folded with two layers in front of the face of the subject. The cloth was folded back on itself, because it could not completely wrap the head, most likely due to the raised position of the right arm that was still fastened to the cross. As a result, it was doubled back over, creating a repeating parallel stain on a second layer of cloth. It is believed that the head was tilted down to the right, so that it was pressed against the shoulder, and the arms were positioned in a way that resulted in the sedarium being wrapped in this manner. Side, number one in the image, seems to mirror the opposite side, number four. It was folded in the center, the middle of the cloth from top to bottom. That shows where it was folded over on itself. The principal stain is composed of three groups of superimposed stains. 
a trapezoidal stain surrounds the nose and mouth. And here in the folded state, the lines in black overlap and demonstrate the match. The blood on one sheet sucked into the other, and that gave a similar profile of the blood stains. In the image row above, we can see an illustration of how the sidereum was folded. And in the lower two images, how the cloth was fixed with pins on the back side of the head, and on his beard, on the front side. The forensic analysis of the cloth leads to the conclusion that it was used around the head of a corpse stitched to its hair and its beard. It remained in this folded state for about an hour. The cloth was not totally wrapped around his head, probably because some sort of obstacle impeded that operation. The cloth, which was attached to the back of the head, was secured with pins, possibly made from thorns, based on the punctures in the cloth. The pins were conical in shape, similar to a needle. There are a number of perforations, related to the formation of the stains and the original use of the linen. Some of these were produced and the sidereum was fastened to the head of the deceased, using sharp instruments that scientists believe were pinned to the beard and hair. They have a truncated conical nature, and appear in pairs, indicating the possibility that thorns were used. The wrinkles and perforations in the image indicate where the cloth was secured on the beard of the man. The holes circled in blue are surrounding some folds in the fabric and they caused these folds. The holes circled in red correspond to stitches on the hair. The stitching of the sidereum to the nape hair was the first and involved a single layer. The stitching of the sidereum to the beard involved the two layers of the cloth. The lower main stains observed in the sidereum were produced by a mixture of blood and pulmonary edema at the rate of 1 to 6 that flowed slowly from the nose and mouth while the corpse was in a vertical position with the head inclined 70 degrees forward in relation to the vertical axis. Pulmonary edema is characteristic of crucifixion victims. This blood has been determined to be post-mortem blood. The sidereum, therefore, would have to have been placed on the head of a crucified man about 4 p.m., who had died about an hour before. The lower part of the principal stains was formed with the body in a vertical position while hanging on the cross. The body had to have been in that position for one hour in order to form the quantity of liquid found on the cloth, with the right arm raised, and the head inclined forward and 20 degrees to the right. Almost an hour after the death, at about 4 p.m., the nose and the mouth of the man started to slowly leak reddish fluid-like blood soaking the beard and mustache. In this position, the lower parts of the main stains were formed it is important to remember that the blood stains on the sidereum were formed on a three-dimensional face and appeared on a flattened cloth. After approximately one hour, at about 5 p.m., once the Roman centurion pierced the corpse's thorax, the body was taken down probably with the arms still fixed to the horizontal beam. For unknown reasons, the caretakers who moved the body decided to turn the corpse face down. In this posture, the nasal flow ran into the back of the nose and soaked the upper part of the main stains that were covering the bridge of the nose and the forehead. The corpse remained like this for almost another hour. This time, the cloth surrounded and was enveloped around the entire head of the cadaver, which was perfectly covered by this sort of capucha or hood that remained fastened to the hair, and a knot was formed. Afterward, the corpse was placed face up, still remaining with two layers in front of the face, and his arms were placed along the sides of his body. This movement resulted in an increase in blood leakage from the nose and mouth. Probably at this moment, this flow reached the back of the neck and soaked the corner of the sidereum fixed over the nape producing the butterfly stain and the corner stain. When the stains on the nape of the neck on both cloths are superimposed, the edge of the sidereum falls on the change of direction of the ponytail on the shroud. It is hypothesized that during the transport of the tomb, a fusion of cadaveric fluids was coming out from the mouth and the nose. And it was attempted to stop them, placing a hand over the maculating effluent in diverse positions. Probably another cloth was used to carry Jesus to the tomb, which was not the Shroud of Turin. Let's give a closer look now at the principal stain, which is composed of three groups of superimposed stains. Dr. Villalane Blanco, a Spanish criminologist and forensic physician, directed the blood study to determine the nature of the stains and how they were formed. 
The techniques were carried out in the laboratories of criminology and forensic biology at the schools of forensic medicine in Madrid and Valencia. The principal stain is composed of three groups of superimposed stains. A trapezoidal stain surrounds the nose and mouth, which scientists believe was formed by the pressure of a closed fist that was exerting pressure on the nose in order to contain the flow of blood. The trapezoidal stain was one of the last to be formed because it only appears on the first two surfaces of the cloth. It is believed that the finger-shaped stains were formed when the body was being moved to another location, in an effort to suppress the flow of blood from the nose and mouth. There are several stains that are marks left from the fingers, trying to suppress the flow of blood and pulmonary fluid. Finally, later, at 6 p.m., the cloth was removed and sprinkled with aloes and styrax, a substitute for myrrh, and put on the head again. Now we look here in the upper right-hand corner of the actual sidarium and you have a bunch of these wrinkles or folds and this is a mock-up here on the right this would have probably been where the knot was formed so we still have evidence of the knot that was tied to uh to fix the sidarium on the head of the victim. It is interesting that a 5th century manuscript mentions that the sidarium was knotted at the top of the head. The author, Nanos of Panopolis, was paraphrasing the Gospel of John, chapter 20, and added this detail. After the body was moved, it was positioned face up, and the cloth was removed from the head, still knotted. It was covered with aloe and myrrh to preserve the blood, according to Jewish custom, and set apart in the tomb. Finally, the sidarium had to be removed from the corpse because it was sprinkled with aloes which are still imbibed in the blood and remain on the surface that had been in contact with the face. It implies that the sidarium was no longer wrapping the head. We resume the sequence of events as follows, Jesus' death happened at 3 p.m. The sidarium was placed around man's head almost an hour after his death, around 4 p.m., when he was still on the cross. He remained in a vertical position with the sidarium for about another hour. Around 5 p.m., the body was taken down and the corpse was left face down. The corpse remained like this for almost another hour. Afterward, around 6 p.m., the corpse was placed face up and moved to the tomb. Just before the corpse was covered with the shroud, the sidarium was removed. In the case of Jesus, there was not much time. So the shroud was probably just wrapped and laid over his body, as shown in the image above. We can assume that the sidarium with the blood of the deceased man had to be buried near him in the sepulchre if the burial was a Jewish entombment. The sidarium was put aside close to the corpse in the sepulchre. Let's give a look at the coincidences that evidence that the sidarium wrapped the same man of the Shroud of Turin. Both clothes have been used for a bearded man with mustache and long hair arranged behind in a ponytail. The shroud shows a crucified man and the corpse of the sidarium died in an upright position. Moreover, in both cases, the executed man was tortured with a crown of thorns. Finally, in both instances, the blood corresponds to the scarce type AB. It is easy to see the back of the hair in the shroud image. If we look carefully and use the reinforced negative image, we can clearly see long hair falling from the bottom of the nape of the neck to the space between the shoulder blades. The ponytail can also be observed on both clothes. The ponytail could be a result of the attachment and sewing of the sidarium around the central back strand of hair. There is a distinction on the cloth between lifeblood and post-mortem blood. One can distinguish that from taking samples from the cloth and the blood that came out through the nose and mouth mixed with the pleural edema fluid is post-mortem blood. Forensic analysis of the bloodstain suggests strongly that both the sidarium and the shroud covered the same human head at closely different times. Bloodstain patterns show that the sidarium was placed about the man's head while he was still in a vertical position, presumably before he was removed from the cross. It was then removed before the shroud was placed over the man's face. There are many points of coincidence between all these points and the shroud of Turin, the blood group, the way the corpse was tortured and died, and the macroscopic overlay of the stains on each cloth. This is especially notable in that the blood on the sidarium, shed in life as opposed to post-mortem, corresponds exactly in blood group, blood type, and surface area to those stains on the shroud on the nape of the neck.
If it is clear that the two cloths must have covered the same corpse, and this conclusion is inevitable from all the studies carried out up to date, and if the history of the sidarium can be trustworthily extended back beyond the 14th century, which is often referred to as the Shroud's first documented historical appearance, then this would take the Shroud back to at least the earliest dates of the sidarium's known history. The Ark of Relics and the Sidarium have without any doubt at all been in Spain since the beginning of the 7th century, and the history recorded in various manuscripts from various times and geographical areas takes it all the way back to Jerusalem in the 1st century. The importance of this for Shroud history cannot be overstressed. Dr. Alan Wanger developed a method of overlaying images in different light polarizations to find what he calls points of congruence and published the technique in the journal Optics. This technique has now been widely adopted in the U.S. courts with anywhere from 45 to 60 points of congruence between two images being sufficient to prove common identity in the U.S. court of law. Dr. Wanger used this same technique to compare the blood stains on the sidarium and the Shroud of Turin with startling results, the frontal stains on the sidarium show 70 points of coincidence with the Shroud, and the rear side shows 50. It is hypothesized that these are the stains observed in the sidarium that were produced coming from the nose and mouth, probably while the corpse was in a vertical position with the head inclined 70 degrees forward in relation to the vertical axis. The upper red arrow shows the stain from the nose, and the lower red arrow shows the stain from the mouth. Numbers 1, 2, and 3 on the shroud correspond to marks on the sidarium. These are just a few among many others that have been detected. It is important to remember that the bloodstains on the sidarium were formed on a three-dimensional face and appeared on a flattened cloth. It is therefore necessary to eliminate the extra 2 cm formed by the base of the nose to see how the stains conform to a face. The nose is 8 cm long, with an extra 2 cm from the base of the nose. Once we move up the cloth about 2 cm, the central stains align with the mouth and the nose. Professor Monaro, who is the director of the sculpture department at the University of Seville, Spain, has conducted a geometric he reconstructed the anatomical elements that are present in the head of the sidarium, and has found that they match exactly with the Shroud of Turin. Not only do the overall dimensions of the head and the shroud match, but also the bloodstains on the shroud correspond exactly with the wounds on the head. If we place the shroud and the sidarium, face cloth, together and focus on the bloodstains, there are numerous similarities. For example, there is a blood-free area on the sidarium that corresponds to swelling on the face of the shroud with almost perfect accuracy. There are several other elements that match perfectly as well, but explaining them one by one would be too much detail. Furthermore, it is atypical to find soil dirt in this zone of the anatomy, but it is just the same zone where a particular presence of dust was found in the Shroud of Turin. The very low concentration of strontium traces in the sidarium matches also well with the type of limestone characteristic of the Rock of Calvary in Jerusalem. Stains from puncture wounds are on the part of the cloth that covered the back of the head, composed of vital blood that flowed before death had occurred. The cloth was applied to these wounds about 60 minutes after they had bled, or one hour after the person had died. These are the most interesting and significant blood stains on the cloth, for the simple reason that they match the stains on the Shroud of Turin. They match both as a fairly close pattern, but also they're both the same blood type which is maybe the same blood group and the same blood type, in other words, bloodshed in life, and it's a blood type that was not particularly common in Europe but was more common in the Middle East. As we have seen, there are many parallels between the man on the shroud and the man of the sidarium. Many different anatomical elements as well correspond to the faces of the shroud and the sidarium. There are many points in common between the two that are undeniable. It is rational to conclude that they wrapped the same man. But the coincidences do not end here. Scientists have determined that the sidarium is made of linen with a Z twist, the most common type of weave in the Roman Empire. It has a taffeta texture, the simplest type of weave, and it does not have selvages on any of its edges, or any dye. 
The linen has a large number of defects, such as loops, loose basting stitches, and the crossing of parallel threads of the woof, indicating that the cloth was made on a vertical loom with weights and that it is very old, likely from the first century. There are about 30 types of pollen grains, at least 9 grow in Palestine, a point of comparison with the Shroud of Turin. Quercus, home oak and Kermes oak, Pistacia palestina, mastic tree and terebinth tree, and tamarix, tamarind tree and salt cedar, only grow in Palestine. The analysis of the white particles found on the linen was especially difficult, and they were finally identified as particles of resin of aloe and myrrh. There are clusters of myrrh, more specifically storax, and aloe. A mixture similar to that which, according to the Gospels, was used profusely at the burial of Jesus. It is mentioned directly in the Gospel of John, Nicodemus came as well, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, following the Jewish burial custom. Something revealing was found that links this fabric to some kind of funerary custom, some particles that are found attached to the shroud's own blood. Storax is a natural resin obtained from the bark of various species of trees. It has a sweet, balsamic aroma and is commonly used in perfumes, cosmetics, and incense. Storax was used in burials in Palestine during the first century. Storax was one of the materials used in the process of embalming or preparing bodies for burial according to the customs of the time. Storax was known for its aromatic properties, and it was used as an ingredient in perfumes and ointments that were applied to the body to mask odors and preserve the corpse. Storax was believed to have medicinal properties as well, and it was used as an antiseptic and an anti-inflammatory agent in the embalming process. The use of storax in burial practices during the first century in Palestine is supported by historical accounts, including references in ancient texts and inscriptions, as well as archaeological discoveries of storax residues and storage containers in tombs and burial sites in the region. It was also established that there is human blood in the sedarium. The clinical tests were positive for globulin, and it is blood from group AB, the same as that of the shroud. The blood with some specific exceptions is blood mixed with another liquid. It is a mixture of one part of blood with six of the serum, specifically taken from pulmonary edema. The human nature of the blood was confirmed by the identification of mitochondrial DNA. In 2012, scientists detected the presence of structures that are compatible with dried blobs of fibrin. The most likely hypothesis is that such blobs were formed within a body cavity, pleural and or pericardial. To reach such a condition, the individual must undergo severe trauma as the scourging and a few hours must elapse to allow the fibrin formation before the fluid is released. The fibrin accumulated in the pleural cavity needs a path to reach the sidereum. This path could be the wound from the spear that connected the cavity with the respiratory tract. In the sidereum of Oviedo, the presence of these fibrin blobs free from blood elements could be another indirect proof of the scourging, because the formation of fibrin requires a previous injury. This is the most plausible hypothesis for the formation of the fibrin elements. To reach the sidereum, the fibrin could flow out through the nose and the mouth, together with blood and the liquid of the edema from the lungs. Samples from the sidereum were subject to carbon dating. At the Second International Conference on the Sidarium of Oviedo, in Spain, in 2007, it was reported that the sample from the Sidarium was dated to around 700 AD, while the history of the Sidarium is very well established and there are definite references to its presence in Jerusalem in AD 570 and at the beginning of the 5th century. In 1990, the Sidarium of Oviedo was dated by the Carbon-14 method. Two samples of the sidarium were dated which, were cut out in 1979. Macro photographs of these samples sent to Arizona and Toronto are shown in the image above. There was uncertainty about the conditions of conservation of the samples from they were taken, 1979, until they were radiocarbon tested. One of the earliest references to the sidarium of Oviedo is found in the writings of Antoninus of Piacenza, an Italian pilgrim who visited Jerusalem in AD 570. Antoninus described the cloth that was believed to be the sudarium or sweat cloth of Jesus. 
The oldest surviving manuscript of Antoninus' account of his pilgrimage visiting Jerusalem in AD 570, is a Latin manuscript entitled Itinerarium Antonini Placentini Peregrinatio ad Loca Sancta, translated, The Journey of Antoninus of Piacenza to the Holy Places. This manuscript is preserved in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, France, and is dated to the 8th century. It is a handwritten copy of Antoninus' travel diary and provides valuable insights into the Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land during the late antique period. Chapter 12 of the story of the pilgrimage reads, There is a cave on the bank of the Jordan, where there are seven cells with seven girls, who are put there as little children. Whenever any of them dies, she is buried in the cell, and another cell is built and another girl is put there, so that there are always the same number. People from outside prepare their food. We entered this place with great fear to pray, but we saw nobody. The sidereum that covered Jesus' head is said to be there. Ancient documents relate that the sidereum was safeguarded in Jerusalem until the Persian invasion of 614 AD. The Christians fled to Spain with a chest filled with relics, stopping briefly in Alexandria, Egypt. The chest remained in Seville during the time of Saint Isidore and was transferred to Toledo after his death in 636 AD. When the Muslims invaded Spain in 711 AD, they quickly conquered Toledo, so the Christians absconded to the north with their relics. The holy chest was hidden on a mountaintop near Oviedo for fifty years. The relics were then transferred to a monastery in Oviedo until King Alphonsus II built the holy chamber in the year 812 AD, now part of the cathedral. All the studies carried out so far point in one direction, with nothing to suggest the contrary. The sidereum was used to cover the head of the dead body of Jesus of Nazareth from when he was taken down from the cross until he was buried. The sidereum provides strong, independent evidence for the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. If the Shroud is a fake, then the sidereum must also be so. Such a wide range of evidences as presented here strengthens the tradition that both cloths have wrapped the same body that of Jesus of Nazareth. This makes the job of any potential forger close to impossible. The two cloths authenticate and validate each other and together they provide a strong case for being the original burial cloths of Jesus. And both coincide and fit perfectly the Gospel accounts. Carbon Dating One of the most significant arguments against the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin is the results of carbon dating tests that were conducted in 1988. This finding has been used as evidence against the Shroud's authenticity, suggesting that it could be a medieval forgery rather than the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. The carbon dating results from the 1988 tests are often cited as a significant argument against the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin because they provide a direct scientific measurement that places the Shroud's origin in the Middle Ages. This finding challenges the belief that the Shroud could be a relic from the time of Jesus Christ, as it suggests that it was created much later in history. The carbon dating tests were conducted by three independent laboratories at the University of Oxford, Arizona, and Zurich. Using radiocarbon dating, which is a widely accepted scientific method for dating organic materials. They indicated a medieval date range, leading many to question the shroud's authenticity. The test results were one of the most eagerly awaited scientific announcements of all time. A radiocarbon dating test was done on a piece of cloth taken from the corner of the shroud. There were a lot of problems with dating, problems that are still discussed today. When the sample was taken, there was a discussion for more than an hour about from which area the sample should be taken. It was taken from a corner that experts had advised against because a corner was missing and it was also an area that was held often by clergy during expositions. It had also been suggested that more than one area be tested to make sure that the sample tested was representative of the whole cloth. Instead, only one sample was taken from the suspect corner and given to three different labs. There are three main arguments brought forward disputing the dating results. One is the medieval repair, the second is the biocontamination, and the third, the carbon monoxide one. Another argument is that the sidereum from Oviedo matches in several aspects the Shroud of Turin, and it is very likely that it covered the same man as the Shroud of Turin, and it is radiocarbon dated to the 7th century. One of the first ideas, immediately after the dating results, put forth by syndenologists and archaeologists as the late Paul Maloney on the left, 
the late Maria Grazia Ciliato, and William Meacham, was that the area from which the C-14 sample was taken had been repaired, which would have thrown off the range given to the final tabulation results. Sue Benford, and Joe Marino, started to look seriously into this hypothesis around early 2000. Marino studied the shroud for 45 years and innumerable hours. He wrote two books and dozens of articles about it. He and Benford concluded that based on the evidence they found, the sample dated was a combination of 1st century cloth and 16th century cloth. In 2000, Sue Benford and her husband Joe Marino shared a photo of the sample that was carbon dated by the lab in Zurich with three textile experts. The photo was shared blind, in that the textile experts were not told the photo was of the shroud, or told what to look for. All experts who were given photos noted differences between the left and right sides. One noted, there is no question that there is different material on each side, it is definitely a patch. Another said, the float is different on either side of the sample. In France, there was a method called French invisible reweaving, used by master weavers in the 16th century. The weaver replaces each broken thread, one at a time. The late Sterp chemist Raymond Rogers had access to samples that were radiocarbon dated. After analyzing the samples, he had to admit what Benford and Joe Marino hypothesized was right, the original linen shroud, contained additional cotton threads. The samples from the cloth that was radiocarbon dated, had cotton in them. He published a science paper in 2004, concluding that the radiocarbon sample was not part of the original linen of the Shroud of Turin. The radiocarbon date was thus not valid for determining the true age of the Shroud. The raw data from the three labs, which the labs, against all norms, refused to release immediately, were finally obtained through a Freedom of Information request in 2017. Careful analysis of that data supports the notion that the shroud sample dated in 1988 was a combination of 1st and 16th century cloth. This hypothesis has been disputed. For example, we read in John Loftus' book, Christianity, in the Light of Science, as follows, the alleged patched area exists only hypothetically and is based on the circular reasoning of shroud defenders. Moreover, a team of Italian chemists presented a scientific paper demonstrating that Rogers's mass spectrometry pyrolysis spectra did not support his assertions, they called the hypothesis of the carbon-14 sample having been taken from a patched area, unsupported, and, indeed, pseudoscientific. So how sound is this objection? Let's give a closer look. Multiple lines of evidence show that the samples came from a repaired corner. The Savoy family ruled over the region of Turin in Italy for several centuries. The Savoys owned the shroud from 1453 until 1983. In the late 16th century, Duke Emmanuel Philibert of Savoy ordered the shroud to be transferred from Chambery, France, to Turin, Italy, where it has been kept since then. The shroud had been kept in Chambery, France, and the Duke feared that it might be damaged or destroyed due to political turmoil and religious conflicts in France. He decided to move the shroud to his capital city of Turin in Italy, which was under his control and considered a safer location. The Duke was devoutly religious and had a personal devotion to the shroud. He believed that the shroud was a genuine relic of Jesus Christ and wanted to bring it to Turin as a sign of his faith and piety. He hoped that by having the shroud in his capital, it would bring prestige to his reign and enhance the religious significance of Turin. The shroud would also attract pilgrims and tourists, thus boosting the local economy and consolidating the Savoy's political power in the region. King Umberto II of Italy, whose family used to own the shroud, says that in 1694 they repaired the shroud's heavily frayed and missing edges. Umberto described how according to his family tradition, in generations past his family gave threads from up to 10 centimeters inward from the edges of the shroud as gifts. In the past, the edges of the sheet had become so tattered as to cause embarrassment or criticism of the custodians, and those areas were repaired and rewoven, attempting to blend the new sections in, as best possible, with the original fabric. Vittorio Amadeo II, along with his wife, the Infanta Anna d'Orleans, personally assisted Sebastiano Valfer on June 6, 1694, in repairing the burial cloth shortly before transferring the relic to the new chapel of the Garini. Furthermore, even earlier, 
in 1532, there was a fire in the church in Chambery, France, where the shroud was being kept. On April 16, 1534, Chambery's poor Clare nuns repaired the shroud, sewing it onto a backing cloth, the holland cloth, and sewing patches over the unsightliness of the damage. This became known as the Holland Backing Cloth. The removal of all patches and of the reinforcement Holland cloth backing of the shroud, in the year 2002, confirmed what King Umberto had stated. Namely, that small sections of the repaired and rewoven edges had continually been removed from the relic. In 2002 high-resolution images of each corner of the shroud were made. The shroud becomes much darker toward the corners. Either with contamination from many hands holding it by the edges throughout history or with the edges being repaired and subsequently dyed to a similar color to match. In this image, we see the approximate locations of the questionable area used for C-14 dating in the laboratories in Arizona, Zurich, and Oxford, in reference to the full frontal portion of the shroud. One of the numerous scientific tests conducted in 1978 by Sterp included spectrally resolved quad mosaic photography. This study, utilizing state-of-the-art NASA technology of the time, was designed to generate color discriminability products capable of conducting a chemical distribution analysis of the surface of the linen cloth. According to the Sterp researchers in charge of this study, the generation of color products was considered the most important image processing task. From a color-enhanced, relative color display, the color of different features of the image can be compared. The colors, of course, indicate different chemical compositions. Researchers at the University of Kent explained that, multispectral imaging entails acquiring several images of the same scene using different spectral bands. For instance, a digital color camera detects three separate images for the red, green, and blue components of light. The STIRP authors noted that, if the chemicals were spectrally differentiated, the multispectral classification process could provide a map of chemical composition throughout the shroud image. According to textile historian Mechthild Fleury Lemberg, who observed the area during her work to restore the shroud in 2002, the shroud's missing corner pieces which were already missing prior to the 1532 fire, were added during repairs made due to fire damages in 1532. In the image, we can see the Holland backing cloth, which goes underneath the Oxford, Arizona, and Zurich sample areas, and where it was seamed. Both the exposed Holland cloth and the adjacent radiocarbon sample area are a uniform dark green color. Images of the larger dorsal missing corner piece section, also exposing some of the Holland cloth, have a completely different chemical color signature, consisting of a myriad of lighter toned colors. Soon after the radiocarbon test was published, in 1988, Raymond Schneider published a science paper, worth mentioning. He wrote, when the carbon-14 dating of the Shroud of Turin result was announced in 1988, the tests concluded that the shroud was woven of flax whose age was estimated to be between 1260 and 1390 AD. This result flew in the face of many expectations of authenticity but was welcomed by many as revealing the shroud to be simply inauthentic and it was then popularly heralded as a fake. However, this rush to judgment contradicted most of the science and scholarship previously invested in the shroud. It is perhaps a measure of the respect in which C-14 dating is held that the finding tended to discredit the earlier work, yet it is a questionable scientific practice to vest one kind of result with such weight as to completely discount the results of a large body of prior work. Indeed. I might add to that, 25 multidisciplinary tests of the STIRP team are simply dismissed, in favor of a highly questionable carbon C-14 test for which there are excellent reasons to believe that it was invalid? The recommendations involved more than three labs, a mix of both counter labs and AMS, accelerator mass spectrometry, labs, and most importantly samples from multiple sites. The decision to limit the dating to three labs, using only the AMS method and restricting the sampling to a single highly contaminated site were all outcomes determined by a politicized and highly bureaucratic process of Byzantine proportions. The blue quad mosaic image is a multispectral false color image which reflects the surface chemical composition of the shroud. It rather clearly shows that the sample region just to the right of the raised patch covering the sample taken in 1973 is different from the rest of the cloth. 
Although more subtle, the UV fluorescent image taken by Vern Miller is also darker in that region and this can be seen in both the UV fluorescent image as presented and in the false color image resulting from John Morgan's analysis. These images established the poor choice of the region near the ray sample and had there been a significant study of the site selection for the dating would likely not have been selected. But there wasn't. Both the exposed Holland cloth and the adjacent radiocarbon sample area are a uniform dark green color. Images of the larger dorsal missing corner piece section, also exposing some of the Holland cloth, have a completely different chemical color signature, consisting of a myriad of lighter toned colors. The dark green encompasses the side seam and extends approximately an inch, 3 centimeters, into the main shroud cloth region. Similar solid geometric patterns with defined borders in this hue are not observable elsewhere on the cloth. This is one line of evidence that permits the hypothesis that the cloth sent to the three laboratories for the radiocarbon C14 testing consisted partially of restorative surface dyes that were attached by invisible medieval repair and partially to the original cloth. A well-supported estimate, based upon weave pattern changes, has been posited reflecting approximately 60% of the C-14 sample consisting of 16th century threads while approximately 40% were 1st century in origin. The radiocarbon date was calculated using the percentage of observed the 16th century versus 1st century weave types appearing in the Oxford subsample. Sterp chemist Ray Rogers, microscopist John L. Brown, and Pam Moon each independently examined fibers within and or near the carbon-dated sample. They found a plant gum likely gum arabic, a common ingredient in tempera paints, is a major presence, coating the carbon-dating sample threads. In contrast, Rogers reported that no sample from the main part of the shroud showed any feature even remotely similar to the coating in the anomalous area. Brown described the dye as obvious evidence of a medieval artisan's attempt to dye a newly added repair region of fabric to match the aged appearance of the remainder of the shroud. As mentioned before, the reweaving hypothesis has been disputed. Not only by John Loftus in his book. Many different objections have been raised. It would extrapolate this video to go into all the objections. I recommend investigating for yourself. Dive deep into the science go beyond the surface, and be honest with yourself. We are not short of methods offered to us to do our investigations, like the internet, books, seminaries, and other ways. Do not simply stick to what you want to be true, but try to follow the evidence, no matter where it leads, even if not in your desired direction and conclusion. The second argument against the reliability of the carbon dating test is the biocontamination. Even before the radiocarbon dating took place, in March 1986, archaeologist William Meacham, quoted earlier in this video, presented a paper entitled Radiocarbon Measurement and the Age of the Turin Shroud, Possibilities and Uncertainties, at a Symposium on the Shroud. The C-14 dating method often gives brilliant results but has limited reliability. Although the theoretical principles are well-founded, when applied in real conditions, a non-negligible percentage of measurements provide aberrant results that archaeologists consider invalid. 24% of the tested results are on average either doubtful or unacceptable. In the paper, he warned in regard to radiocarbon dating about contamination of samples, particularly by carbon from other sources. He wrote, the existence of significant indeterminate errors can never be excluded from any age determination. No method is immune from giving grossly incorrect datings when there are non-apparent problems with the samples originating in the field. The results illustrated, in this paper, show that this situation occurs frequently. Emphasis added. Regardless of the C-14 result, evidence from other sources would of course remain of considerable importance in the overall evaluation of the age and origin of the relic. A C-14 age later than the first century would not of course constitute scientific proof of the inauthenticity of the shroud, since radiocarbon dating is based on a number of unverifiable assumptions the most important in this context being that the carbon extracted from the sample is indeed identical with the carbon absorbed from the environment when the sample was alive. The third argument against radiocarbon dating is that it has been observed that carbon monoxide in the sea level atmosphere is significantly enriched in radiocarbon well above that found in normal biogenic quantities derived from carbon dioxide. 
only about a 2% carbon contamination relative to the overall carbon in the sample would be required to move a 1st century date of the shroud textile to the 14th century. According to archaeologist Eugenia Natovsky, in archaeology if there are 10 lines of evidence, carbon dating being one of them and it conflicts with the other 9 there is little hesitation to throw out the carbon date as inaccurate due to unforeseen contamination. The biblical narratives related to the passion and death of Jesus confirm the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. And the Shroud of Turin confirms the authenticity of the Gospels. So 25 multidisciplinary tests of the STIRP team are simply dismissed, in favor of a highly debated carbon C14 test for which there are excellent reasons to believe that it was invalid? There is no conclusive proof that the radiocarbon test provided results according to what really happened, and pieces of evidence must be weighed in the context of all the available evidence in order to be judged. When one makes a web search, is the Shroud of Turin fake? An article published in 2018 pops up first. It starts with the following claim, forensic scientists have once again concluded that the Shroud of Turin, supposedly the burial cloth of Jesus was wrapped in after his crucifixion, was artificially created. The conclusions of the study suggest that the bloodstain pattern analysis performed on the Turin Shroud demonstrates that the alleged flowing patterns of blood from different areas of the body are not consistent with each other. Moreover, the authors hypothesize that post-mortem bleeding to generate the lines on the lumbar area, belt of blood, seems to be unrealistic. Based on these inconsistencies, the study suggests that the Turin Shroud was not an authentic artifact but rather an artistic or didactic representation from the 14th century. It seems to me that, based on these supposed inconsistencies, concluding that the Shroud is a forgery, is taken out from thin air. There are good reasons to reject such a conclusion. The study has been heavily criticized by forensic anthropologists. Alfonso Sanchez Hermosilla for example wrote, the article presents numerous formal and conceptual errors that deprive it of scientific credibility. The experiment does not even remotely reproduce the conditions in which the blood stains of the Turin Shroud have occurred. In these circumstances, the conclusions of the article are totally devoid of scientific value. The authors of the article, given their inexperience and lack of the minimum necessary knowledge, have committed serious errors in planning and interpreting the results of their experiment. The article is not suitable for publication in a specialized scientific journal, it is assumed that people who have assessed the suitability of the article should have the necessary knowledge and experience. In the case in question, either they do not possess it or have ignored it for unknown reasons. A more recent paper from 2019, which didn't make it into popular news journals, concluded, our forensic analysis was based on live suspensions on a cross with volunteer subjects, a methodology that was not used by Barini and Garla Shelley, and our conclusion of the scientific experiments and analyses of the same blood flows have reached the opposite conclusion. The blood pattern on the shroud, in reality, permits to make precise studies and describes the painful movement that the individual made on the cross. The characteristic blood stain on the left wrist formed by two diverging streaks, for example, is particularly notable, as it indicates two different positions assumed by the condemned man on the cross. The BPA study used only one single individual. Therefore, it may not be representative of all individuals who were crucified, and the conclusions drawn may not be universally applicable. The study acknowledges the possibility of different episodes of bleeding, such as movements of the body or post-mortem bleeding. It does not provide any definitive proof that such episodes did not occur and could not have contributed to the bloodstain patterns on the shroud. The conclusion that the shroud was an artistic or didactic representation from the 14th century is entirely based on assumptions and is by no means definitive proof. Garkla Shelley seems to have made it a life mission to discredit the Shroud of Turin. His book, The Shroud on Trial, was published in 1998. In 2010 he published a science paper, Life-Size Reproduction of the Shroud of Turin and its Image. His thesis was that linen can be aged artificially by heating it and then washing it in water. Next, red ochre, iron oxide, could be applied to a body, and the linen cloth then could be rubbed over the body's prominent features. After that, the bloodstains, 
burn holes, scorches, and water stains could be added for the final effect. Garla Shelley tried to reproduce the image on the shroud. He ordered a herringbone linen cloth exactly the same as that of the shroud, both in terms of yarn type and weight. The cloth was spread over a volunteer, and only the most prominent parts were rubbed with a reddish ochre pad. The image was then finished freehand after having spread the cloth on a flat surface. We have in fact ascertained that it is not possible to apply the color with the pad in a uniform way when the body is still under the cloth. The face alone was made with a plaster bar leaf. This is the only way to avoid a complete distortion of the features and obtain a result similar to the face of the shroud. Garla Shelley claimed in the paper that the the image on the shroud is made up of two components, an iron oxide pigment on the fibers and a uniform yellow coloring throughout many of the fibers. It's common knowledge that iron oxide was a regular ingredient in many medieval paints. Garla Shelley was not the first coming up with that hypothesis. Macron, in the 80s, as well concluded that the shroud was simply a beautiful painting. He then celebrated the result on TV, claiming, Our results seem encouraging and should be welcomed as an interesting contribution to the resolution of doubts about what is the mysterious object par excellence. The premise of the iron oxide argument is simple, some iron oxide is rubbed on the shroud. Except that virtually no iron oxide particles have been found on the shroud at all, let alone the millions of particles you'd expect would cover it all. Professor Garla Shelley tried to explain the absence of any traces of iron oxide on the original shroud by stating that the pigment on the original shroud faded away naturally over the centuries. This is not a statement that you would expect from a serious scientist. The spectroscopic investigations being done in 1978 would even show the slightest traces of iron oxide present on the shroud and it is a totally unscientific to state that they disappeared naturally, being a unsupported, just so, assertion. This also doesn't explain the bloodstains. There's no image under the bloodstains, whilst every attempt to replicate the shroud by using iron oxide always adds the bloodstains after. A forger would have to literally add the bloodstains in the correct positions, then rub iron oxide around it perfectly. And around the bloodstains are fluorescent serum halos, which haven't been explained or replicated by proponents of this theory either. And to top it off, the shroud can be used to make a 3D model whilst the iron oxide rubbed image has no 3D properties at all. The opinion of many was that the reproduced shroud was so ridiculously far off that it was not evidence against but rather evidence in favor of the impossibility to reproduce all the fine intricacies of the original. The result was soon archived and not mentioned any further. A lot of criticism rained down on the association that backed up and financed the experiment, especially from many experts, believers and non-believers alike. Many other attempts besides Garla Shelley's to replicate the shroud have been made over the years, but none with successful results. But who are the authors of the article? Luigi Garla Shelley is an Italian chemist from the University of Pavia. Barini, an anthropologist, claims to be a Catholic, and Garla Shelley is an atheist and skeptic with a flying spaghetti monster logo prominent on his blog, so make of that what you will. The UAR, or Union of Atheists and Agnostic Rationalists. Don't tell me they didn't have an agenda. To our next point, another very common reason skeptics give for saying that the Shroud of Turin is a forgery, is a statement by Bishop Pierre d'Arcis of Troyes, France, in 1389, that his predecessor Henri de Poitiers, about 34 years earlier, had gotten a confession from the artist who supposedly painted the Shroud of Turin. To understand let's give a closer look at the historical context of the story. In 1204, during the Fourth Crusader campaign, Crusader armies captured, looted, and destroyed parts of Constantinople, then the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Reports of Crusader looting and brutality scandalized and horrified the Orthodox world. In 1205, Theodore Angelus, a member of the Byzantine aristocracy in Greece wrote probably on behalf of other members of his social class, to Pope Innocent III, expressing how they were outraged by the Crusaders' actions. 
the historical document provides insight into the events surrounding the event. In the letter, Angelus protests against the Crusaders' looting of Constantinople and the desecration of important religious artifacts, including the most sacred of all the linen in which our Lord Jesus Christ was wrapped after his death. After the sack of Constantinople a great silence in the shroud history begins. There is some evidence that it went to Athens with Othon de la Roche who became the first Frankish lord of Athens in 1204. He may have sent it back to France or perhaps it entered the custody of the Knights Templar and was used in their initiation rites. The story that connects the two theories has yet to be written. However there is significant evidence that both are true in some way. Until Geoffrey I de Charny, a French knight, came into possession of the Shroud of Turin around the 1350s, probably a gift from King Philip for his services. He built a small, wooden church in tiny Lirae, outside the city of Troyes, France, where he was lord, to house various relics. De Charny kept the shroud in his castle at Lirae and occasionally exhibited it to the public. The exhibitions of the shroud in Lirae attracted thousands of pilgrims and visitors, who came to see the cloth and venerate it as a sacred relic. In the meantime, in 1353, Henri of Poitiers, an abbey from the vicinity, was appointed bishop of Troyes, Lirae's nearest large city. This small lead medallion was made to celebrate pilgrim visitation to shroud expositions in Lirae, in the mid-14th century. It depicts two clerics, which heads are missing, holding up, with crossed arms, the shroud. This is the first certain picture of the shroud, complete with both the back and front images, even capturing the shroud's herringbone weave. In 1389 the French bishop of Troyes, Pierre d'Arcis, wrote an angry memorandum to Avignon Pope Clement VII. Darcy's declared that about 34 years earlier, 1355, the Lirae Church's dean, the chief cleric, had obtained the cloth, falsely and deceitfully, to milk the pilgrim trade and had even hired individuals to pretend they had been healed miraculously during expositions. He went on to claim that his predecessor at that time, Henri de Poitiers, Bishop of Troyes between 1353 and 1370, had been advised by theologians against the possibility of the cloth's authenticity and, after further investigation he discovered the fraud and how the said cloth had been cunningly painted, the truth having been attested by the artist who had painted it, to wit, that it was a work of human skill and not miraculously wrought or bestowed. Supposedly Henri then tried to confiscate the cloth but the dean hid it until, in Diars's time, a new dean, also, with fraudulent intent and for the purpose of gain, initiated a new round of expositions, with the assistance of Geoffrey II. Darcy's was particularly piqued as Geoffrey II had circumvented the bishop's authority by recently securing permission from a cardinal, the pope's representative. The memorandum of Pierre d'Arcis appears to make a strong case against the shroud's authenticity and has formed the cornerstone for skeptical historical judgment, especially during the 20th century. First and foremost, where did the bishop obtain his information about Henri de Poitiers and the painter who supposedly produced the relic? It was not from any known documentation, D'Arcis was a competent lawyer before his clerical appointment and surely would have referenced any files from thirty years earlier. If Bishop Henri de Poitiers had discovered fraud and opposed the relic showings during the 1350s, he left no known record for D'Arcis to cite. Instead, after reviewing de Charny's papers related to the new Lirae Church's activities, Henry's sole surviving document, dated May 28, 1356, praises de Charny's devotion adding, and ourselves wishing to develop as much as possible a cult of this nature, we praise, ratify, and approve the said letters in all their parts we give our assent, our authority, and our decision research throws considerable doubt on whether the Diarsis document was any more than an unsigned, undated and unsent. Memorandum, not even written by the said bishop. There are several authentic papal documents concerning the exhibition of the cloth at Lirae in France in the 1300s which reveal a dispute between Diarsis and his predecessor and its then owners, the de Charny family and there is an authoritative and well-researched current opinion that the Diarsis document represents no more than a hasty judgment jotted down during the heat of a debate. Whether Diarsis wrote the document or not, and whether it is genuine or not, really doesn't matter because there is so much more to be considered before one can say whether or not the shroud is a forgery. Last not least, the Sturp team, during their investigation in 1978, 
did find no pigments, paints, dyes, or stains, which preclude the possibility of paint being used as a method for creating the image. Professor Edward Hall of Oxford University said, there was a multi-million pound business in making forgeries in the 14th century. Someone just got a bit of linen, faked it up, and flogged it. Hall was one of those, on the left in the smaller black and white picture, that made the announcement of the radiocarbon test C-14, in 1988. He was a trustee of the British Museum. It's clear from Hall's blunt assessment that he had no doubts about the Shroud's history. He declared that anyone who still believed that the Shroud was authentic should be a member of the Flat Earth Society. Hall made several simplistic, arrogant, and scientifically questionable statements. He was an extremely biased and narrow-minded researcher. Hall was however insofar correct in claiming that there was a lucrative trade in forged Christian relics in the 14th century and churches around Europe would use these to attract pilgrims from far and wide. In this artwork made in 1247, for example, we see King Henry III of England carrying the relic of the Holy Blood of Jesus. But is it justified to claim that the Shroud of Turin is just one of dozens and dozens of shrouds that were produced in the Middle Ages? This image shows the representation of a shroud that was claimed to be the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, in medieval France. It was known as the Shroud of Bisankin. According to historians, the Shroud of Bisankin disappeared during the French Revolution. It was found to be the work of an artist. On May 24, 1794, the shroud was taken to Paris where it was announced that the cloth would be converted to lint for the hospitals. In the image, we see a painting and embroidery on the silk of this shroud, from the 18th century. In this image, an engraving on silk from 1660 shows a frontal image of the shroud of Bisankin on a stiff panel held up by three prelates. In an age of mass pilgrimages, the shroud of Bisankin had its share of renown. On May 22, 1535, 30,000 pilgrims came to Bisankin on the day of an exposition. Viewed through today's eyes, this appears to be nothing more than a simple, almost childlike painting, but it was widely believed to be a true relic with a miraculous imprint. Surprising is that many believed that both shrouds, the Shroud of Turin, as well as the Shroud of Bisankin, were authentic. One might think that it was completely silly to believe this, but there is a reason that could even justify that belief. It is hypothesized that another shroud was used to transport Jesus to the tomb, which was not the same as the linen cloth that would cover Jesus in the tomb. It was believed that the Turin shroud was the bloody body of Christ just taken down from the cross, the sudarium of Bisankin, on the other hand, was supposed to be the washed and anointed and composed in the tomb. This explanation precluded any rivalry between the two shrouds, and indeed made them complementary. Beginning a hundred years after the Shroud's first appearance in the West many dozens of painted copies were made, most still visible today, but all look crude and almost ludicrously amateur by comparison to the original. Last, researchers have taken another look at the Latin in Diars's famous memorandum and made a key observation. The Latin phrase so casually translated as, it was proved by the artist who had painted it, could also be rendered, the artist who had copied it. Researchers recognized that the Latin depingir, to paint, is ambiguous but that the verbal construction throughout this section of the memorandum makes the best sense if an artist making a copy gave his opinion that the image was made by human hand. This might also help to explain some indications that a hidden shroud, thought by many to be the actual pre-1349 shroud but obviously a painted copy, was supposedly found in Bisankin's about 1377. In March of 1349 a fire destroyed the cathedral church at Bisankin and apparently also a shroud kept there. A painting was possibly created to replace the shroud that had been at Bisankin and the shroud we know of today as the Shroud of Turin began being displayed in Lirae. The following argument brought up quite often, supposedly refuting that the Shroud of Turin is the authentic burial cloth of Jesus, is the claim, that according to the Apostle John, Jesus was not wrapped in a linen cloth, but in strips of linen, like an Egyptian mummy. This is based on the verses in John 19 verses 39 to 40 where it says, Nicodemus accompanied Joseph. Taking Jesus' body, 
the two of them tied it by strips of linen in company with the spices. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. And John 20 verses 6-7 says, Simon Peter, saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen strips in a place by itself. John says Jesus has wound in linen clothes the Greek word that he's using is athonium which in the plural refers to strips of linen. Now let's have a look at what the Synoptic Gospels say. Matthew 27 verse 59 says, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Mark 15 verses 45 to 46 says, Pilate gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb. And Luke 23 verse 53 reads, Joseph wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb. John uses quite a different terminology from the others. He uses a word that means to, tie, to bind small linen strips, cords, to describe the material used for such a tying, similar account of Lazarus. The Synoptic Gospels, in contrast, all three, do not mention strips of linen, but a linen cloth. So that does not indicate some sort of contradiction, but complementarity. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three use the same verb in Greek, which translated in English, means wrapping, roll in, or wrap in. The same verb is used in John chapter 20 when he describes the face cloth, the sidarium, being folded up in a place by itself. John is describing Jesus being bound up with strips of linen this would have been a quick and effective way of combating rigor mortis and keeping the shroud in place for a quick burial until they could return to the tomb after the Sabbath had ended. Pathologists who have studied the shroud have theorized that the body underwent a cadaveric spasm. This is where the body undergoes a rapid state of rigor mortis very soon after death. The arms of the victim would then have been frozen stiff in the position how they were outstretched when hung on the cross. So let's do a quick summary. First we have the shroud this is the Greek word syndon and it's used consistently across all three synoptic gospels. Next, we have the linen strips. The Greek word authonium appears in John's account of not only the burial but also the resurrection where we find them laying on the floor of the tomb. And here in John chapter 20 we also see the only reference to the third fabric in the Passion the face cloth which is the Greek word sidarion which is kind of a handkerchief or a napkin or a small towel, which is a reference to the sidarium of Oviedo. So I think it is clear now, that we are talking about two, if including the face cloth, three pieces of fabrics that were used. Another claim is that the image on the shroud is anatomically incorrect. Dr. Pierre Barbet, who wrote the book, A Doctor at Calvary, for example, wrote, I am first of all a surgeon, and thus well versed in anatomy, which I taught for a long time, I lived for thirteen years in close contact with corpses and I have spent the whole of my career examining the anatomy of the living. The whole picture reveals a perfectly proportioned anatomy, it is well made and robust and is that of a man about six feet high. Joe Marino published a paper with a long list of reference science papers of doctors, which attest that the man on the shroud is anatomically correct. He mentions Dr. Robert Buckland and Dr. Frederick Zujib, who studied the shroud for about 50 years each, as well as performing a combined approximate 50,000 autopsies, believed the shroud image was of a real, crucified man who died. Many advanced anatomical studies have been performed, and they attest that the image on the shroud is anatomically correct. Sergio Rodella is a well-known artist from Padua, Italy, a passionate sculptor who has created numerous sacred works. He created a 3D model of the man on the shroud. He followed the indications of a team of academics, that have been studying the shroud for years, and publishing science papers on the topic, doing anthropometric analysis of the man on the shroud, with the most sophisticated technologies available to science. And as well thanks to his remarkable knowledge of human anatomy, this realistic 3D model was made. The model, presented to the public in 2018, 
further corroborates that there is nothing wrong with the anatomical proportions of the image on the shroud. Rodella's statue is a life-size three-dimensional representation of the man of the shroud, created on the millimeter measurements obtained from the shroud in which the body of Christ was wrapped after the crucifixion. The members of the team that created the sculpture also presented the results of their work in a scientific publication. They wrote, the resulting human body produced by the detailed study is of extraordinary beauty, well proportioned, fixed in his post-mortal collapse still hanging on the cross, apart from the recomposition of the head, arms and feet, he shows evident signs of intense muscular effort along the whole body, isometric type, with muscular prominence, and respiratory reliefs. With such an overwhelming number of professionals in the field attesting to this, this point should be less controversial. Isn't the shroud a violation of the commandment that forbids making a graven image? This is one of the most common objections that some Christians have raised regarding the shroud. The prohibition comes from one of the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. What exactly is a graven image? By definition, it is a man-made object or artwork, such as a statue, that is worshipped as a god or in place of a god. But decades of scientific investigation itself have provided strong evidence, if not proof, that the shroud is not an artwork of any kind. If the shroud is authentic, then man did not make the image, God did. Nonetheless, sincere intentions motivate this question. It is helpful to understand this commandment from the Jewish perspective. The Hebrew scriptures sometimes articulate a style of Hebraism known as a Hebrew doublet. This is what is found with this prohibition against graven images, Exodus 20 5 6. The subsequent restatement following this prohibition provides the Hebrew doublet which clarifies the meaning of the prior statement. Below is the subsequent Hebrew doublet statement, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. The prohibition against graven images applied to making images for the purpose of idolatrous worship. If it were not for this Hebrew doublet clarification, then all images would be prohibited, including all photographs, paintings, statues, etc. of anything in heaven above, the earth beneath, or in the ocean. Another objection is that the man of the shroud has long hair. Skeptics will often quote from 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14 where it says, Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? What constitutes long hair depends on one's own culture's subjective view. Jewish men in the first century had shoulder-length hair, that was the norm. What Paul was speaking about is, men who wore their hair in styles peculiar to women. What Paul was really concerned about was not the lengths of men's and women's hair, but, that man is to be distinguished from woman. Paul's point is that men should look like men in that culture, and women should look like women in that culture. Experts agree that facial features identify the man buried in the shroud as a Caucasian. Carlton Kuhn, a leading ethnologist, says he has the physical features of a Jew or Arab. The man's hairstyle, characterized by a beard and long hair parted in the middle, further identifies him as a Jew. In addition, the hair in the back is cut in the form of a pigtail, a hairstyle very common in first-century Jewish men. It is thus probable that this crucified person was a Jew. Even today, in Orthodox or Hasidic Jewish communities adult males, have long hair and beards. Jesus followed the law of Moses. Furthermore, there are biblical passages that show that long hair, per se, was not a problem to God. In Numbers if God himself instructed Moses that, if, a man or a woman makes a, vow of a Nazarite, then amongst other things, no razor shall touch his, or her, head for the duration of the vow. And King David's son Absalom was praised for his very long hair. Many other reasons are commonly given in the attempt to refute the authenticity of the shroud. It would take too long to get into all of them. But those mentioned in this video, are the ones that I have heard more often. While the preponderance of evidence and the high coherence suggests that the shroud is authentic, the 1988 carbon dating test is an exception. 
The shroud has been shown to be a remarkable and totally unique object with an image that is simply unexplainable as a 14th century forgery. Such a forger is quite impossible. There is little question that the carbon dating technology was professionally applied, but it depends on the sample being representative in order to be accurate in dating the cloth and there is a massive amount of evidence that the samples were not only not representative but had been modified and manipulated with intrusives, dyes and that the dating actually follows closely the UV fluorescence. If you believe the shroud is a fake, then you must explain how, whoever fabricated it before 1353 AD must have. 1. Know the precise methods of crucifixion in the first century. 2. Be proficient enough in over 100 scientific disciplines and also collectively outweigh the intelligence of the people who performed hundreds and hundreds of tests on the shroud and who are not finding any indications of a forgery. 3. Possess the medical knowledge of a modern expert surgeon. 4. Utilized an art process unknown to any great master, never duplicated before or since. 5. Be able to foresee and approximate principles of photographic negativity that would not be discovered for centuries. 6. Imported a piece of old cloth of Middle Eastern manufacture. 7. Used a coloring agent which would be unaffected by intense heat. 8. Be able to incorporate in his work details, that have only recently been discovered, that the human eye cannot see and that are visible only with the most advanced computer scanning devices. 9. Be able to reproduce flawlessly, on a nearly flat linen surface, in a single color, undistorted 3D characteristics of a human body in a negative format on the tops of the threads, while conversely showing the blood as positive and soaking all the way through. 10. Get somewhere the blood of a tortured man, and apply it before creating the image. 11. Create the sidarium of Oviedo with all the intricacies that match the Shroud of Turin. 12. Get limestone from Jerusalem, and pollen particles from the Middle East, in special from plants with thorns, that flourish only between March and April. All of this had to have been done prior to 1353, for since that date the Shroud has a clearly documented and uninterrupted history. And even now, with all the scientific and technical skills at our command, our scientists and artists cannot duplicate the Shroud. Others claim, that the gospel is embellished accounts of a first-century preacher, and the miracles claimed are later additions, traditions, and myths. Others, like Muslims, claim, that God cannot die. That Jesus, therefore, was not God, and that it was not Jesus, that died on the cross, but someone else. With the Shroud of Turin, we have material, empirical evidence, that confirms the authenticity of the Gospels, and the truthfulness of the eyewitness accounts, which reported what they experienced and saw, in the Gospels. And on the other hand, the biblical narratives related to the passion and death of Jesus confirm the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin provides evidence for the historicity of Jesus Christ and refutes the claim that he did not die on the cross. The shroud bears the image of a man who appears to have suffered the same kind of wounds as Jesus did during his crucifixion, including the crown of thorns and the spear wound in his side. The image also shows bloodstains and other physical details that match the biblical accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. Giulio Fanti, Shroud Expert, The Shroud has been called the Fifth Gospel. If we compare the Shroud, Gospels, and Bible in general, we find so many correspondences that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to think that this man was not Jesus described in the Gospels. Apart from the fact that this image cannot be reproduced, it was even more difficult, if not impossible, to reproduce all these things. This is because we have additional information about the Shroud that complements what is written in the Gospels. For example, on the Shroud, we see the signs of a small whip, and here I have reproduced the various signs of the whip. For those who believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Shroud of Turin holds immense significance. It is a tangible link to his physical presence on earth. The Shroud of Turin is a piece of history that has been studied for centuries. It is believed to date back to the first century and therefore, provides a window into the historical context of Jesus' life and death. The Shroud of Turin has been the subject of scientific research for decades, with researchers attempting to determine its age and authenticity. If you don't believe this is Jesus' Shroud that's fine, 
but the shroud is the most accurate representation of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you will ever see. Note these words. John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So if you think it's a fake, it's still the most accurate representation of the wounds described in the Gospels. If you believe it's a deception it still reveals exactly what Christ suffered for the sins of the world. If you believe it's an idol, it still demonstrates the love of Almighty God better than any man-made image. Jesus died so that you can live eternally, don't miss out on God's promise. Praise the Lord for His unspeakable gift. If you want to learn more about the Shroud of Turin, and the Sidarium of Oviedo, the author of this video has also published a two-volume book, available on Amazon. Confirming Yeshua Confirming Yeshua is the one stop to go, probably the most comprehensive collection of information out there, corroborating Jesus Christ as the foreseen Messiah in the Old Testament, the Savior of the world in Isaiah 53. Volume 1 is an invaluable resource for readers seeking a deeper understanding of the evidence supporting the reality of Jesus Christ. Volume 1 explores one by one the fulfillment of over 300 prophecies about the Messiah in the life of Jesus, examines the historical reliability of the Gospels, and provides evidence for the events surrounding the resurrection of Christ. With careful analysis of archaeological findings and textual evidence, the book demonstrates strong evidence supporting the historicity of Jesus and the accuracy of the Gospel accounts. In a world where misinformation and wrong claims are widely disseminated, Confirming Yeshua provides a comprehensive and evidence-based response to objections raised against the historicity of Jesus and His resurrection. Volume 2 is an invaluable resource for readers seeking a deeper understanding of the evidence supporting the reality of Jesus Christ. Confirming Yeshua, Volume 2, provides a comprehensive exploration of the life, teachings, and significance of Jesus Christ from multiple perspectives. This volume takes a deep dive into the history, science, and faith surrounding the Shroud of Turin. The book explores the biblical references to the burial shroud of Jesus, its chronology from AD 30 to the 14th century, recent scientific discoveries, and overwhelming cumulative evidence that supports its authenticity. Divine Verses, a poetic retelling and exploration of the Gospel of Matthew is a wonderful book, offering readers a new, refreshing, unique, an artistic approach to engaging with the biblical text of the Gospel of Matthew. Through the medium of poetry, this book invites readers to experience the timeless story of Jesus Christ in a fresh and captivating way. With rich imagery, lyrical language, and deep reflection, Divine Verses illuminates the life, teachings, and significance of Jesus as presented in Matthew's Gospel. It is illustrated by AI-rendered images based on the iconic image of Jesus on the Shroud of Turin. Through cutting-edge AI algorithms, these images have been brought to life, offering a remarkable glimpse into the face of the man who is at the heart of our faith. The images are beautifully detailed, capturing the nuances of Jesus' features with remarkable accuracy as never been done before. This poetic commentary book delves into the Gospel of Matthew, using the power of poetry to retell and explore its stories, parables, and teachings. The verses bring to life the historical and cultural context of Matthew, evoking the sights, sounds, and emotions of Jesus' ministry. Through poetic language, Divine Verses offers a new perspective on the profound truths and messages contained in Matthew's Gospel. Let me read you, The Burial of Jesus. Matthew 27 verses 57 to 61. The Burial of Jesus, a Solemn Tale. As evening fell, a rich man set sail. Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple true. Took Jesus' body, a sad task to do. He wrapped it in a clean linen sheet. With love and care, made it complete. And placed it in a tomb of his own. A new one, carved out of solid stone. A boulder he rolled, to seal it tight. 
and bid farewell to Jesus' sight. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the two, sat opposite, watching what to do. The sorrowful scene, a moment frozen. As darkness crept, and night had chosen. To hide away the body of Christ. Until the day of resurrection, suffice. Oh, what a pain, to see him die. But hope remained, to reach the sky. For Christ had promised life anew. To all who believed, and followed through. The burial of Jesus, a sad affair. But in the end, hope was there. For death could not hold the king. And victory was his, in everything. For you were bought at a price in order to start a new life, that belongs to God, and that glorifies Him. I purchased those that receive me as Lord and Savior with my sacrifice, suffering, and my own blood. I did not come to be served, but to give my life as random for you, to become a mediator between you and my Father, and make you free. You were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with my blood, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Bought, purchased, and redeemed, are all terms used to describe a financial transaction. When you complete a transaction at the store the cashier gives you a piece of paper that describes the details of the price paid. It's called a receipt. The shroud is the receipt of the transaction. For the Father so loved you that He gave me, His one and only Son, that you believe in me, you shall not perish but have eternal life. If you want to be born again in spirit, and become part of those belonging to the church, the family of God, if you want to make this decision, watch on this channel, the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, and subscribe. Shalom, Blessings